Thanks, everyone. I, uh, I couldn't actually even tell my mom who lives here that I'm here because I'm, I think, in Seattle for 15 hours. Uh, got in last night about midnight and have to unfortunately leave directly after my talk. So I apologize because this is such an awesome seeming conference and I was really looking forward to spending some time. But with the new job and movers coming and the weather challenges we've been having back east, uh, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. So today we're going to talk about the future of experience design and that it is omni-channel, which yes, is a buzzword and is a buzzword that is actually waning in popularity, but the concept behind it is still critical, uh, so that's what we'll talk about today. A little bit about me, uh, great introduction, thank you. Um, I did just join Ralph Lauren um, five weeks ago, I believe, uh, to head up their global digital product management and user experience teams. Super exciting. Uh, I spent a year at Razorfish doing consulting because I had never done that before, which was great. Uh, and then my time at REI here in Seattle, I'm a Seattle native, uh, was of course fabulous. It's tough to beat a company like that. But I'm also just really passionate about creating great, holistic, omnichannel customer experiences. And it's something I've been living and breathing and thinking about for, gosh, six or seven years now. I don't know, I'm looking at Misty to <laughs> say if she has any idea. It's been a while um, and it's been fun to see the transition in the world around us and, and with all of you, I think there's so many more people who are understanding how important this is. So the usual disclaimer I have to put in, all comments, thoughts, and opinions are my own, not of uh, anybody else's or of my company. So poll, raise your hand if you've moved across the country. And keep your hand up if you have moved across the country with pets. All right, those of you, you may want to uh, plug your uh, ears and close your eyes. You might have a little bit of trauma coming back to you because I'm going to tell you my story. So last year, I had a new job at Razorfish. It's been a bit of a <laughs> whirlwind uh, year or two here. Um, and I had a new office here in the Merchandise Mart. Uh, not quite exactly there, but on that floor in the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. So I was moving from Chicago, sorry, from Seattle to Chicago. New apartment, which is super exciting. New life, snow, cold, uh, very, very different than Seattle. And so while I was hard at work, I moved out first to Chicago. My husband was going to be a dear sweet man and pack everything, plus the cats. Yes, that's my husband and that's our two cats. We love our cats, but we have to move the cats. And it's a very, very long way. And it was in the winter. So we decided to fly. We didn't want to actually do the drive um, with the cats. But we have a house, or had a house, here in Seattle, and a lot of stuff. Uh, we've lived in the house for about eight years, so you know how it is, you kind of pile up all this crap that you don't need. So we'd hired a moving company, which was a relocation benefit, so that's fantastic. It's really complicated. Uh, anyone done a relo, like with all these paperwork, and so yeah, you know, I, I see some shaking of heads. <laughs> it's not fun, it is definitely not fun. And, you know, a moving truck, while it's great that they gave us one and are paying for it, it's just not going to work for the cats. And cats can't drive. Uh, so we have to fly the cats. But I've never done this before. We've never done this before. It's a huge unknown how any of this even works. So there's worry and there's stress. And I literally have nightmares for days. I'm sure my husband did too, even though he wouldn't admit it. But he looked very stressed. So how does this work? How is this going to work in terms of moving our cats? Do they get loaded on a conveyor belt with the baggage? Cats can't go through x-ray, so, or at least I would hope they wouldn't go through x-ray. I hope it's not a scene of piled up cat carriers somewhere. So I'm plowing through all of the relocation information and I'm not finding anything. Except I do learn that cats are actually tax deductible. It's good to know. So go to the airline's webpage to try and figure this out. And it has a whole heck of a lot of information. It's really, really confusing information. Pages and pages of heavy, heavy text and very confusing information with forms about the uh, live animal acceptance checklist 
and more forms talking about the weights uh, and types of animals that you can and cannot uh, fly with, and the live uh, animal rates and poundage and all sorts of forms and sizes of kennels and sizes of animals, and none of this makes any sense to me. And, and instead of easing any of my nerves and easing any of my tension about this experience, this website is not helping me feel better at all. It points me to this cargo page, and I'm thinking, well, my cats aren't cargo. That's the whole point, right? We're not going to, I hope, load them in with the baggage on the conveyor belt. So I finally find the pet booking request, and it talks about animal shipping restrictions. So I click on that link. What? You know, I, I need to know now. Um, of course, I procrastinated. I think it was like two weeks before the move that I was investigating all of this. Click on it, and of course, it's not actually the shipping restrictions. It's talking about Bill Me Later, something entirely different, just a, your basic web link bug, but I still can't find my information. So I ask our friendly uh, Alex here for help, but she actually didn't help. It's one of those you know, live chat systems, and, and they really didn't know anything either. So I finally find a page about the pet restrictions and start to figure everything out, and, and the day finally arrives for the move. So here we have no cats were hurt in the filming of this loading of a cat. We have one cat under the belly of the plane and one cat under the seat, because basically I was in Chicago working. My husband was moving the cats. Uh, we learned like at the very last minute that you actually cannot fly with more than one animal yourself. Uh, even if you were to pay for an extra seat. So we had to put one cat underneath, which was very scary, uh, because you know you don't know what's going on. <sighs> the plane finally landed, you know, the, the cat that was under the seat um, had, you know, peed and was crying, and this poor cat's 18 years old, and sadly this cat actually is still in Chicago and needs to move to New York, so I'm stressing about that. Uh, and the website said, you know, to pick up the other cat, the cat who had been under the belly, near baggage. And when we called and, and talked to customer service at the airline, they said, yep, you're going to pick up the cat near baggage. And I don't know if anyone has traveled with pets here at, at SeaTac. There's a pretty conveniently located area in the baggage claim area where you go and you pick up your cats. So great, that's what we expected. That's what everyone told us. That's what Alex told us. No one there. Nothing there talking about pets. We ask people, no one has any idea. So we get in a long line, wait for customer service, and they say, well, I don't know. I don't know where to pick up your, cat, your cats. They have no information either. And in fact, my husband told me later, one of them was you know, looking on the website as well and was complaining about how confusing their own website was. So more waiting around, more waiting around, asking more people, escalating to you know, managers and whoever we could. And, and you know, it's been an, an hour by now, and no one knows where to pick up this other cat. We're not getting this you know, lovely premier access service uh, that we hoped we would get. Eventually, we learn that the cats, at least this cat, is cargo, because in fact, the cat is 20 minutes away at the cargo facility. So my husband has to take a cab uh, with the first cat, uh, who's you know, still completely freaking out, and the taxi driver's pissed because it smells like pee, because we've got you know, the cat who's still in the cat box, uh, you know, the carrier case, and the poor cat's totally freaked out. And get to the place, at the cargo place, and the cats are piled up next to dogs who are yapping, and the cats are crying, and yes, my cats were very sad. Let's just hear a moment of my cats. <coughs> huh, maybe not. Well, that'll probably be good for you. It is very sad. It's all right. They were sad. <laughs> I was sad. My cat will never star in a United Airlines ad. So, what's the lesson in all of this? Anyone have an idea? Yeah. Ex 
Exactly, it's all disconnected experiences. In fact, a holistic experience that I'm looking for, that I'm expecting, that I'm stressing about, big fat failure. So let's think about why that is. Here's the thing, we live our lives across physical and digital, more and more and more. So the future of experience design must be across both physical and digital. They're completely colliding. We can now identify leaves with a smartphone, we can order a pizza with a click of a button. Um, on the bottom left is, is my favorite, even though this is actually a few years old, it's an app where you can, uh, and, you know, it knows your location and you can find local <laughs> hotties that are you know, within a mile of you, within five blocks of you, or if you're really lazy, within 200 feet. <laughs> and this collision is happening even for Luddites. This is my dad and my stepmom. They're wearing 3D glasses. They're obsessed with their smart TV and watching things in 3D. And seeing them try to figure that out <laughs> just goes to show how challenging all this can be. And this will just increase. Uh, I today have with me two iPads, two phones, because I have a work version of each, plus my laptop. I'm not wearing my Fitbit today, but you know, we all are starting to have more and more and more of these devices. It's becoming completely ubiquitous in our lives. This is uh, Barney's, uh, Cafe and Barney's um, in New York, and the table itself underneath where you eat is multimedia and you can place your order by touching on it, and then if you're you know, bored with your dinner companions, uh, you can watch ads and shop. Fridge alarm, uh, so that if you get up in the middle of the night and you open your fridge, this will tweet to everyone you know and post on fa Facebook. <laughs> Samantha is raiding the fridge. Pizza, 1 a.m. <laughs> it's supposed to deter you. Don't think I would want that on my fridge. Physical and digital are happening simultaneously. Has anyone been to Hointer's? Yes, yes. Uh, store with basically, I don't know if it does it have anybody, any people, salespeople in it, or it's, it's yeah. So I don't, I don't know how many of you know Hointer's, but uh, basically it was uh, developed by a uh, former Amazonian, of course, um, and uses robots and uh, mobile technology to kind of you, you basically say what size jeans you're looking for and what style, and it will pick them and put them in a dressing room, I believe. I actually haven't been to one, is that right? Um, built initially for men um, was, was the idea um, who, who might just want to like get in and get out with their, with their jeans. Edible batteries, just starting to hear about these things, um, which sounds horrifying, but basically there's all sorts of technology now where you can you know, swallow a smart pill, essentially, or swallow some sort of battery that will you know, w run a device um, to monitor your health. Uh, and we're, we're, we are becoming digital ourselves. Sensors uh, completely taken off. You can test um, for glaucoma using uh, sensors in, in an iPhone. Uh, you can, um, this uh, guy over here, he's got a little, Bluetooth type device that senses when he's getting drowsy and will you know, tell him, get up, walk around. Uh, I know that I think in somewhere in Asia, I wanna say Thailand, but that may be wrong, uh, they have ones of these for drivers um, and will you know, say, hey, pull over, pull over, starting to fall asleep because it's basically sensing, sensing your movement. So our lives are being completely uh, run just about by digital. Um, we ourselves are becoming the interface. Uh, this was uh, last year at the Consumer Electronics Show. They, they showed an eye tracking um, run iPad. So basically, this person was looking at things on the iPad and could turn the pages or you know, use the touch screen on an iPad just with their eyes, never actually touching it. I also saw you know, gesture uh, running things, and these, you know, these are coming. Um, there's more and more part of our lives every year. Let's see if I can get the sound to work on this. One second. Five years from now, computers will hear what matters. See, 
technology. It is I'm Dmitry always... Konevsky. Today I would like to talk to you about cognitive computing and sense of hearing. Many years ago, when I had my first child, I was frustrated. I often did not understand what she wants, why she is crying. In five years, I expect such application that when baby start to talk to us, we have system to understand what baby says and tells us to parents or to doctors. Cognitive computing, when it talk about application, means that we try to imitate how bread work. It trains much better system that has much better results. As an example, the big problem in Brazil, slides, flooding. So one solution for Alabama lab to solve this, to put sensors that hear sound so they can hear some movement in mountains. It can predict that maybe food is coming. So this example how hearing sensors can help to prevent catastrophes. So this is just one of application for hearing. So in five years you come here and I'll show you this. What's really interesting about that particular one is that was is, is this actually from 2012, um, so we've uh, not got much more time uh, before presumably this stuff will be available. If you find find that interesting, there's a whole there's a whole series on, on cognitive computing and the senses, and it talks about you know how computers will see and how computers will touch. You just look up IBM. Um, five and five cognitive computing. It's uh, super interesting. So we have all of these technologies all surrounding us, permeating our lives, but there's a problem. And this is where our opportunity is. Every single one of you in this room can change the world, and I actually truly fundamentally believe that, uh, because integrated experiences with this technology, with digital, with physical, are few and far between. Because, as we said, we live our lives across digital and physical. How many people saw Andrew Hinton speak? Did anyone in here? I think he was here yesterday, or maybe it's today. He's later today. He's, later today. He's great. Um, this is, you know, actually his perspective from a couple of years ago. You know, the web is not so much technology anymore as a way of being. It's soaking into the pores of our physical lives. And, you know, when he initially wrote this, again, two, three years ago at least, so today even more so. A few statistics. From Google, 90% uh, of consumers move between devices to complete a task. 40% of smartphone users watch TV while browsing their smartphone. I actually think that's low. If that feels low, I'd be interested to know sort of the demographics of that. 65% of multi-screen consumers report that they begun their shopping process from a smartphone. That's huge. And that's, and all of these are growing. 84% of all multi-screen shopping experiences included mobile either as the first or second interaction. We are waking up next to our devices, sometimes under our pillow with the alarm set. So we have to ex design experiences for all of these touch points across all channels. And really, truly, the future belongs to brands that create the best customer experience, experiences across all channels. And what's interesting as, is that this is something that has a marked impact on things like revenue. Uh, consumers cited their greatest frustration as when the experience does not match the promise a company made to them up front. So with my situation with flying with the cats, you know, I felt promised, you know, not outright, but I felt promised uh, from United that, you know, my cats would fly and it would be, you know, a fairly straightforward process and that people would help us along the way as needed. That didn't happen. 86 percent of consumers will pay more for a better customer experience. And only 1% of consumers feel uh, that their expectations for a good customer experience are met. So massive, massive opportunity 
job security. There's, in fact, even just in the time I've started talking about all this stuff, the amount of jobs um, in the customer experience area, which I'll talk a little bit more about sort of what that distinction is, uh, has magnified, it's grown, it's crazy. Because remember, my bad experience, and we don't want that to ever happen again to any of you. So, what the heck do we do? Raise your hand if you work for an agency or are a freelancer. So maybe a quarter of the room. Now raise your hand if you work in-house. Definitely the majority. That's interesting, it's interesting. It kind of just seems to sometimes depend on location and type of conference when I ask that question. Um, this, all of this could apply to both of you. Um, I have now, since I've now done both in-house and some time at an agency, there are differences and I'd be happy to talk with anyone afterwards about what, what those differences are or if you have questions at the question time. Um, but regardless of whether you're in-house or you're at an agency, the tips that I'm going to talk about will, will work because you know, I've done them in both environments. Because here's the thing, successful omnichannel experiences don't happen by magic. Otherwise, everything would be working great. All of these experiences would be connected, not disconnected. So we need to explicitly design for omnichannel. And not just this kind of design that we think of, not just visual design. <clears throat> It's so much about the underpinnings of how everything works and how everything connects. But first, what the heck is omnichannel? Anyone using this term regularly? Hearing it much? A couple of you, a few of you? Kind of depends on the industry you're in. If you are in e-commerce um, or retail or you know, maybe even travel or banking, um, that it tends to be a much, much more used term. Uh, it's, and it's exploded over the last couple of years. So, omnichannel, what is it? Omniscient? Omnipotent? Hmm, I'm thinking, trying to think of omni, all these omni words. Well, that's helpful, actually, because the definition of omni is all, universally. So, let's start over. Here's a single channel experience. This is what life was like for all the years up until really computers were available. You went, to a physical location. You went through one channel, a physical channel, to the bank, for example, or to a store. Then, when we started to get uh, computing going, and also when we started to get like call centers, uh, there were multiple channels, multiple touch points happening independently in these different sections. How many times have you, you know, you've been trying to maybe log into your bank account on a website, and there's something weird happening, and you call, and you enter in your, you know, your social security number, and the person who gets at the other end of the phone, they don't know, you know, know who you are. You have to enter it again. Every time they transfer you, you have to enter it again. It's all completely disconnected. This is sort of this multi-channel experience where each channel is operating independently. Then for a few years, um, and this was really probably just five years ago, um, and I think it really was with the popularity of smartphones and in particular the iPhone. Um, a cross-channel experience pe uh, started to happen. People started to talk about the need for a cross-channel experience where you can actually successfully cross touch points within the same company, within the same brand, and have some sort of unified experience across all of those. And that only, again, that term lasted for a couple of years. And then on the channel, experience popped up. And that's really around the idea that the customer, the consumer, the user is interacting with the brand anytime, anywhere. Yes, they're crossing channels, but it's less about thinking about the channel independently and more about what is their holistic experience regardless of how they interact with the brand. That's Nirvana. And no one is doing it well. There are people who are doing it better than others, Nordstrom, local, good example of uh, you know, really working hard on this. But no one has completely figured this out yet. Again, opportunity for everyone in this room. And as technology becomes more and more ubiquitous, this progression becomes more and more important. We need more and more to be designing for omnichannel, to be designing for all of these channels to work together in a holistic way. Any questions about omnichannel? 
The omni-channel approach is one where physical and virtual channels come together to enable a seamless experience. And at the heart of it, it really is about the best customer or consumer experience. And I use that term these days much more than I use the term user experience. And that's because user experience, while it doesn't have to mean just interacting with a digital device or interacting with a screen, that's generally how people think of it, right? Is you know someone who's making experiences on a website or on a smartphone or something digital better. Whereas customer experience, if you're, you know, you're in a for-profit type situation or, or consumer experience, is broader. It covers all of those touch points across all of those channels, across all of those devices. So it's a term that I generally prefer to use, thinking of user experience as an important subset, but a subset of that. Aha. Now we understand omnichannel. What the heck do we do with that? How do we design for omnichannel? And really, it's how do we design for life? Omnichannel is a buzzword. You'll probably hear it some more. Two years from now, it may be taken over by something else entirely. So how do we design experiences that all of us need and want in our lives? So we're going to do an exercise uh, at your tables. If you're at a table with not very many people, feel free to hop to another table. If you don't like the people at your table, feel free to hop to another table. Spend just maybe two minutes on your own thinking of a recent poor experience across channels or devices. Travel, banking, shopping, these are ones that, that are often rich of examples like my, my airline one. So spend just a, two minutes or so thinking about that, then I'll stop you, and I want you to spend a little time at your table to talk about the stories. Um, just a minute or two, someone can say, I have the best story. And then that volunteer is going to tell their story. And then I want you to discuss the story to identify the main story points, interactions, and emotions within that one story that the volunteer told. So this first exercise is really just to kind of start thinking about all these different channels. We'll spend maybe eight minutes or so on the entire exercise. Begin. Okay, wrap up the last couple sentences. Okay, and pause, please. Hopefully you all got uh, at least started talking about one particular story. Try to keep that story in your mind because the rest of the exercises uh, and discussions today will be based on that particular story. Let's start talking about how actually to design for omnichannel. Five things uh, that I think are, are crucial for designing good omnichannel experiences, and we'll go through each of these in a little, little bit of detail. Omnichannel is digital and physical. It is intertwined. It is anytime, anywhere. It needs to serve needs. And the best omnichannel experiences are, in fact, experiential. So we'll start with digital and physical. Digital, more and more, is enhancing physical. Uh, this is some hangers. Uh, these are some hangers in Brazil that are live showing uh, the number of Facebook likes for each item of clothing. That'd be kind of cool when you're shopping, right? Uh, I've seen versions, uh, Nordstrom actually did a version, um, I think it was, I don't think it was Facebook, it was maybe Instagram. Um, and they've actually started, um, at least in some of their locations, changing their physical store displays based on what's popular on Instagram, which is, I think, super interesting in terms of uh, digital and physical um, working together. Uh, Razor Fish company I used to work for has built um, a, 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 an Audi, um, they call it Audi City. So it's basically, it started in London. Um, Audi wanted to have a you know, car show place. Uh, but in the middle of the city, super expensive, not a lot of <coughs> land. Uh, and so they hired R Razor Fish to build um, a whole sort of car buying experience within a small area. And it uses you know, 3D um, life-sized 
versions of the car that you can yourself, and you can kind of see there's a table, like a touch screen there at the table that you can uh, basically, you know, build yourself and see the car, you know, on the inside, on the outside, what the color change looks like, what the fabric looks like. Uh, and when you get close and you think, oh, that looks really good, then they sort of call um, the place where they actually store all the cars not too far out of the city and they drive it in. Um, and it's been massively successful and they're opening them up all over the world now because it's actually not only brought people in who are curious of this experience of how digital and physical are interacting, but it's worked. It has helped sell cars. This um, is just becoming big. Who's heard of iBeacon? A couple of you. Um, I think this, you know, who knows, they probably said this about QR codes, but iBeacon done right, I think, could really change the world. So basically, you can now walk into the Apple store at Grand Central Station, um, and if you have the Apple app, you can walk in, pick up an iPad, and essentially walk out the door not talking to anybody. You've paid for it via the app and the information the app has, you know, with your credit card, et cetera. And these little devices, these iBeacons that have ridiculous battery life, like months and months and months battery life, that they put all around the store that basically sense um, your phone. These are also being used, I think American Eagle has done a pilot of iBeacon to, you know, do marketing, basically. So when you walk into their store, if you walk by, you know, a particular code, it might say, this code's on sale. Um, I've also seen the, uh, one of the companies um, that's, that's working on, on these kinds of experiences was telling us about um, a pilot that they want to do or have maybe started um, with Crate and Barrel, uh, showing as you walk by a product, product reviews and product information on your phone, Cause I, and I think that's huge. I mean, how many times when you're shopping, you know, you pull out your phone, you wanna access uh, the reviews, but you kinda have to look it up and you have to get to the right spot, and a lot of times inventory isn't the same. So, you know, the capability of literally just walking by and this eye beacon signaling to show you the right information. It's an incredible um, way of, of digital even replacing physical in some instances. So how do we design for digital and physical? Really, it starts with moving through space. Get out of your cube. Um, I tell a story about how when I was at uh, REI, I think I spent, this is so embarrassing, maybe two years uh, before I really walked over the, you know, 100 yards to the marketing building uh, where they, you know, were doing um, display ads and print ads and, and, you know, things that were bringing people to the site. And I had no idea what they were doing. You know, we didn't work together a whole lot. And it was when I like literally got up, went over to that other building, found where they, you know, kind of posted what they were working on, and went, oh my God, all of this is connecting back to the site. I need to be working with these guys really, really closely. And that wouldn't have happened um, had, it, had I not gotten up and sort of seen this stuff. It's hard to find sometimes digitally, you know, it might be on a share somewhere, but but there's an impact of, of getting up and, and seeing what people, especially if you're in-house and, and different divisions are working on part of the customer experience, seeing what they're doing. Um, you know, going into a store if you work in retail, going into a bank, you know, whatever type of industry you're working in and experiencing it, seeing what works, seeing what information in the physical environment works, or maybe what information doesn't work. You know, maybe all of these print um, tickets of information about a tent hanging here at one of the REI stores is not that useful because it's a whole lot of kind of overwhelming information. So just getting into the physical will help you think about where digital could enhance the physical. It's really noticing the world around you. And once you start thinking this way, it's amazing the sort of digital touch points you'll see popping up everywhere. Thinking about where digital might help. Um, you know, I've usually, these touch screen things I don't think often work that well. This was one at the airport in Minneapolis and I had just enough time to get some food. And this was actually super, super useful because I could sort of, you know, it was, it said where I was and I could, you know, go to what type of food I was looking for and, and it would tell me where, where to go. Um, faster than had I, because I tried this yesterday, you know, pulled up the map, 
of JFK, which is an airport I don't know well, and you know, try and figure out where there might be some decent food, because finding food in the airport is always a challenge. Where can digital add to your experience? Um, you know, it's interesting, Adidas has done a ton of innovative work, very few of which I think has actually been launched, but it's interesting in terms of like digital walls where you can, you know, kind of touch the shoe and maybe, you know, design the shoe. And, and while I don't know that any of them have been entirely successful yet, it's interesting to think about where digital can actually add to the experience. Or where is it maybe a gimmick? Um, has anyone seen a magic mirror live? There are these mirrors. Do you find it useful at all? No. You know, for a while, magic mirrors were, were all the talk of the retail industry, because basically the idea is you go and you stand in front of this magic mirror, and um, there's various ways you can do it. Um, you, you have an item, and it'll, you can sort of try on the item without actually putting it on. So it'll overlay digitally uh, the item on your on your uh, on yourself, and I don't know if it's that the technology isn't that good, or that it's actually an idea that isn't very useful. But I haven't seen anyone do it well yet, and I haven't really seen it take off. So that's what's really tricky about this digital physical thing is you can think of all sorts of cool digital experiences within a physical environment. And having worked on things like this for quite a while, I would probably 90% of your ideas will be crummy. So it's really thinking about what will help, either help the customer, you know, help the business, ideally both. Next, omnichannel is intertwined. So there was this TV ad, um, I think it was about a year ago. Uh, it's pretty, pretty compelling, pretty bright. It's for Target, and Target talking about their everyday collection. Uh, which I thought was great. There's a whole collection. I love it when companies sort of curate uh, groups of products that, that, that go together. Um, and so they had this ad you know, on TV, and you could get to it on YouTube, and it was, you know, it was playing on, on websites and such. And they were talking about it everywhere, at least in Chicago. There was ads. The ads were very much you know, in line. The look and feel was the same. The wording was the same. They were all talking about the collection. Uh, bus stops, on buildings. It was a huge campaign. Went to the website, nothing. Nowhere on the website did they mention anything about the everyday collection. And in fact, I tried to search for everyday. You kind of can't really see the details, but that's a screenshot of me searching for the everyday collection. They did nothing to compile those products together for the website. Now, having worked in situations like, like targets on a smaller level, I'm sure a lot of it had to do with people not having the time or thinking about that, getting up out of their cube and talking to the other groups about how these things could or should connect. And the website, even the mobile, even the mobile app didn't have, which is, you know, mobile apps are often used, commerce apps in particular, are often used for kind of marketing campaigns. Even that, there's no, no mention of it. So that was a case where intertwining was not happening at all. So what can we do about that? Build connections. It seems really obvious, um, but it's actually quite difficult to do because everyone's working at a frenetic pace. Everyone's doing their own piece. It can be hard to build those connections. A couple of tools. Has anyone done a, done a touch point inventory before? A couple of you. This is really around literally just listing all of the touch points, the places uh, where your consumer might come across your brand or does interact with your brand. So it could be a TV advertisement, it could be a you know, call center, it could be even packaging if you've ordered something. The packaging that something is wrapped in is something, you know, you have to open the packaging. It's a touch point. Amazon, you know, got a lot of really good press about, I can't remember what the term they've called it, but like simple easy packaging or something where They've you know, been trying to end that whole nightmare clamshell thing that always rips apart my fingers and I'm bleeding all over whatever I bought. Inventorying, just starting by inventorying those touch points at your company or on the project you're working on is such a great first step. And it's amazing to me every time I've done this, either at companies or with clients, 
there are always touch points that people in the room didn't know anything about. Someone over here might talk about, you know, oh yeah, did you know that there's this special secret VIP line that if you happen to know the number, you can call? And you know, half the other executives in the room had no idea. Or this, there's this orphaned website you know, that comes up in Google, but no one internally ever actually Googles their own company, so they don't actually know that it exists. So just starting by inventorying these touch points um, can be a huge benefit. And then you want to map the touch points. And this is thinking about which activities your customer, your consumer, your user uh, needs to do, wants to do, or even what your business wants them to do with the company. And thinking about both in a current state, is it a good experience? Is it a good experience if I call the company, or is it a bad experience? Uh, is it a good experience if I'm trying to do something in my mobile phone and then I go to the website, or is it a bad experience? And, and mapping out what these touch points are currently doing with the idea that you're eventually going to map out how they should be interacting and how they should be working together. And again, I'll tell you, it's rare that people, you know, people are more starting to do this, um, but this sort of talking together about all of these different touch points often isn't happening a lot. Um, is it happening a lot in anyone's company or project that you're working on? Yeah, you want to describe it a little bit? Uh, no, I mean, I work for Space Girl, and... Oh, great. Every, you guys are great. <laughs> every uh, initiative we have, the first thing we do is get every um, stakeholder from every single part in the same room. And so it's like... So there you go, getting up out of your cubes. Or That's fantastic. Yeah, actually, it's funny when I um, was thinking about uh, I wasn't th well when I left Razorfish. It honestly, largely had to do with I re uh, logged two hundred thousand miles of flying last year, all domestic, um, and so that that much travel was difficult for me. And I didn't necessarily want to move out of Chicago. And Crate and Barrel was actually the only company in the Chicago area. I was like, oh, I could totally work for them um, because I'd heard that they did great stuff. So that's great. I mean, I think that's really great. And, and it's not easy, is it? Uh, no. And it's once in a while, like, as you said, like, you'll be in a room and someone will mention something and it's kind of like, oh, we didn't even, like, think about that up front. Yeah, it's amazing. Even when you're having those conversations, how many times? Has anyone talked about whether wireframes are dead before? A couple of you, yeah. Anyone have an opinion? Anyone dare to state an opinion? This can be a tricky territory, yeah. They haven't caught no time to uh, do large scale things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's interesting to think about wireframes. And, and you know, I've been, you know, as, as Whitney sort of coughed earlier with the number of years she's been doing this stuff, I'm kind of similar. It's been a really long time. Um, and, you know, I remember like wireframes, oh my God, that's so cool, you know. And, and at the time, I was working at Amazon and we didn't have, there were no user experience people um, there at all. I was a product uh, pr program manager and I was doing basically the user experience. This was like in the late 90s. And at that point in time, wireframes made total sense. And you're absolutely right, I think on large scale projects um, and complicated you know, layouts, especially when people are arguing about, you know, placement, they can be really useful. But what I think is more useful is flows. And certainly there's a lot of talk about, you know, prototyping and not building wireframe and just prototyping it. And I think that's great. But I actually think the more important piece is what is the flow between all of those pages, all of those screens. Even just starting there, even just from a website perspective, that doesn't always happen. And it certainly doesn't happen very often when you're tracking the flows across channels. So this was something in, in the latter uh, time that I was at REI, very similar to Crate and Barrel, we finally were able to start having those, co those conversations with all the different stakeholders. And we built these cross-channel maps to say, you know, on the left, those boxes are basically outlining where traffic to the website or to the store would be coming from? What is marketing doing? And then we would map out what needs to happen on the website and where and what needs to happen in mobile 
and what needs to happen in the store and what visual merchandising assets need to be created and what training needs to happen for the call center. And it was, you know, it's a fair amount of work, but suddenly everything was so much better tied together. Everything was much more intertwined. And so really identifying those touch points, mapping those touch points, and then thinking about the flow of the customer across all of your touch points um, is a huge first start. If you did only that, um, you'd be ahead of a lot of companies right now. So next exercise. With the story your volunteer told, identify the touch points. So those are where the, vo uh, the volunteer, the person telling the story, touched or interacted with the company and the channels. Was it you know, via TV? Was it a phone call? Was it mobile? Was it website? Discuss which ones worked and which ones didn't. So specifically talk about the touch points and the channels. Spend about five minutes on that. Okay, wrap up. And pause. Thank you. Next, we're going to talk about omnichannel is anytime, anywhere, at a restaurant, outside, in bed, on a mountain. This guy is uh, tweeting that he's like climbed the top or maybe just base camp of Everest. Ah, uh, that scares me. So how do we build experiences that can support all of these anytime, anywhere interactions that we are increasingly doing? I think one big key is understanding context. The context in which people are functioning, what is their environment, uh, what's happening, what are they trying to do, all those aspects of context. And what's really interesting is this is a place where mobile can really link the digital and the physical and can really tie together all of these different interactions, all of the people, places, and things, because so often now, and it's funny when I've watched you guys tell some of your stories, I see people you know, doing this and you're, you're sort of you know, showing, gesturing um, where mobile was fitting into your touch point. And increasingly, this is the connector for us. So think about where mobile might help in particular contexts. So crazy lines, um, a lot of retailers are now implementing mobile checkout to help um, with, with you know, lines and not, to not have everyone have to pile to the cash register, the cash wrap, they call it, um, and, and using a mobile point of sale system to, to be able to check people out. Whoa. Uh, what about a really, really big box store? Uh, location services, uh, you know, how do you find the product that you're looking for? This is another really good place where mobile um, because it is so anytime, anywhere, just by its very nature, can help connect the digital and the physical. Serving travelers. You know, I haven't found a lot of augmented reality to be helpful, um, but things like this where you could, you know, hold up your phone or soon it'll just be Google Glasses um, to see, you know, what restaurants are around you or what direction to go. Um, would be would be great, you know, sort of overlaying all that information, uh, not just sort of on your screen, but but with your actual environment. Omnichannel is also about serving needs, and how do we do that? Well, we need to provide service, and I'm not saying that you need to go this far. This was me back in my bartending days. Um, I was quitting. <laughs> That's why I had a big fat smile on my face. I didn't have to wear that horribly ugly tie anymore. But sometimes I think it's, I don't know if it's ironic or coincidental that um, I started my sort of you know, adult life 10 years in the restaurant business, 10 years serving customers. And it's, I think, become so embedded into sort of who I am and how I think. And I wonder if that has something to do with, with why this customer experience thing and, and serving people and their needs um, is so interesting to me. Does anyone recognize what's going on in the TV there? It's from Sunday. <laughs> Woo! Go Hawks! Um, this I thought was an, this was interesting. Um, 
I was, uh, this was in, in temporary housing, and I had the TV on, was, you know, watching the Super Bowl. I was by myself because my husband's still in sh Chicago. It's a long story, temporary housing. It's depressing. Um, so I was doing some shopping, and literally, when I pressed the button on Overstock, it was overstock.com, literally, I pressed the button and my phone rang. I was like, that's weird. I picked up the phone, and it was a fraud call uh, because it was a pretty big purchase I was making on Overstock, and it, actually, there had been a fraud charge that I had, didn't know about from the Dominican Republic like an hour before. So I, that was like, I, I was really impressed with sort of it serving my needs at that point in time, like immediately. Um, and I think, I don't know if, if, if it had, I don't know if it had come up on the screen to, for me to call them, I don't think I would have done that. Well, you know, and, and so it was, you know, how, it was really American Express who, call, who uh, called me, and, and, and that phone call was something I, I picked up. So that was, to me at least, the right touch point, the right channel, at the right place, at the right time to serve my needs and to avoid, you know, keeping this credit card open that clearly somehow someone in the Dominican Republic got the number. But service is getting harder and harder. Um, this is a photo of an uh, Amtrak conductor. It's, you can't really see, but he had like five devices on his belt because they're not all integrated yet. You know, he had his device for scanning the tickets and he had his uh, uh, walkie-talkie thing and he also had, I think it was like a, an iPhone with a sled on it, with a, you know, a, har a hardware wrapper on it for him to be able to track um, reservations and like where the train was in relation to where it was going. This is another example of trying to use a, a Groupon and this poor lady, you know, like she had to have it in print, but then she had to use her phone and she's sitting at a computer and she's using all of these multiple things at once. Service is getting harder and harder. Um, and as I said, often one device doesn't cut it. This is a, a, was at REI where we learned after some research that the employees on the floor were carrying both their personal phone and the mobile point of sale device we had given them. And we, couldn't understand why until we started talking to the employees. And we learned that, you know, they, they had uh, uniform problems and they couldn't shove all of their, the things that they needed uh, into their uniform. And so what was happening was the mobile point of sale system that we had given them that wasn't being used as much as we wanted it to be and, and, and it wasn't, you know, wasn't successful, we couldn't figure it out. They were carrying around their personal cell phone because the personal phone got them to product information on the website. And we had built the mobile point of sale system just totally to do the mobile point of sale. And so they still had to carry these two devices. And so what was happening is they weren't using the mobile point of sale. They weren't offering it because they were trying to cram it into their uniform. They were often going back into the stock room to stock things and climbing up and down on the ladder. And this was a quote we got. It is usually in my pocket and gets caught on the ladder all the time. I've started leaving it here on the shelf instead. We would have never known that unless we did some research with the employees to understand service and to understand how they were providing service to customers and how they could better, more easily provide service. So we did a lot of following them, took a lot of notes. We did a diary study um, across the country with a variety of stores and a variety of employees working in the store. And we even did a co-design, a number of co-design sessions with, with them, which was incredible because, you know, those of us in corporate and those sort of the white ivory tower, as, as these sales associates often think, we don't know. We don't know what their day-to-day -day life of serving customers is. And so having the employees who did know designing the services was huge and it was incredibly successful. And then we went on to do things like a service inventory. So thinking about not only those touch points and channels, but actually what services do people need? Do people need a mobile po point of sale? Do they need to be able to see product reviews um, when they're in the store? Do they need to be able to talk to somebody and ask questions maybe? when they're in the store or when they're on the website thinking about a really high ticket purchase. So thinking about what services exist, which ones work well and which ones don't. If you look up service blueprint, 
There's a whole lot of ways to basically map out services and think about the front stage, really where those employees are, and the backstage, and all of those systems and how they work. Um, you need to plan all of this. You need to you think about services. And it doesn't have to be pretty. You can do this with Post-its and a whiteboard. Um, I don't know if, if how many of you have heard of the discipline service design. We have a few of you. Uh, this is a great book. Um, it has a ton of different tools and examples in it. There's a website as well. Um, and it's really, uh, I would say, you know, first cousin um, or maybe even you know, brother-in-law of user experience and customer experience because it's really around how do you design services that um, consumers and customers need. And I think blending the tools that we have learned as user experience designers with the tools that service designers use, and some of them are the same and some of them are different like service blueprints, is really what enables us to design for Omnichannel. So, spend a few minutes, about five minutes, thinking about in your story what services would have helped improve the experience. What type are they? And which ones make sense when? Like that phone call I got about the fraud charge, that made sense for it to be a phone call even though I kind of don't like being called. I probably wouldn't have responded as quickly and the situation wouldn't have been dealt with as quickly. So spend about five minutes talking about that. Start to finish your thoughts. And pause. So hopefully even just talking about these touch points, these channels, these services will help you start think to think in a different way. Um, I've run a lot of half day and full day workshops on this topic with you know big post-its and fun active exercises. Unfortunately, 90 minutes is a little tough to do, to do that in, but I wanted, I wanted you to hear each other's stories, um, to hear and talk about uh, these things because I think sometimes getting out of our own heads um, and having conversations about what other people see, what other people are encountering um, can be super, super useful. So hopefully um, you came up with some interesting ideas in those conversations. So finally, uh, Omnichannel is experiential when it's at its best. Uh, and it's really about how does digital enhance the environment. Um, I haven't actually gotten to use this, I'd love to. It's basically an augmented reality app in London that overlays um, photos of old time photos in the physical location that you're standing in. So you can kind of see what was happening, what it looked like at that exact spot that you're standing. That's a case I think where you're really sort of enhancing the environment. Enhancing yourself. Um, there's a lot of, like the magic mirror, there's a lot of attempts out there, I don't know that any of them work yet, uh, to be able to try on jewelry, very expensive jewelry. I've tried makeup on using some of these uh, virtual apps. And, you know, many of them are pretty clunky so far, but, but some of them um, I haven't used yet because I couldn't get it to work, the Crate and Barrel 3D room app. Do you know much about that? I don't, unfortunately. <laughs> I've been dying to try it because I just moved into my apartment. And uh, anyway, yeah, Crate and Barrel has this app, which I haven't been able to, to download, um, around you know, being able to sort of envision your space and use an iPad to uh, show in your space what furniture would look like in there. Uh, anything you want to add? Uh, no, but if you want me to help you figure it out later, let me know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's me. That's the problem. You never know whether it's you in these situations. So often you think you're doing something wrong. Um, I love this. This is the Cleveland Art Museum, which is an amazing museum, and it's free. Um, and they have apps that you can use, and I think more museums are having these now. You, you basically can learn about uh, the, the, the sculpture or the picture that you're, you're walking by. Um, and I just think that's amazing. I mean, on the one hand, the, you know, the video tours, or sorry, the audio tours are great, but um, I, I thought this was really great because it could really sort of point out particular things in, in 
the, uh, the picture and, and teach you about them. And more and more, Omnichannel and these digital experiences are about having fun. Um, last week, well, Super Bowl, uh, they shut down, what, 13 blocks of Broadway in New York, all through Times Square. And there was a lot of like digital craziness going on and people were just having fun with like interactive stuff and you know massive projections of you know David Beckham on 50 stories of buildings and it was immersive and it was fun and, and it was experiential. So how do we design for those experiences? And this has been kind of a theme, but get off your butt. Get away from those screens. Raise your hand if you mostly work with designing for screens. Most of us. And, and, and honestly, I, I still spend, you know, my team still spend a lot of time doing this. Um, but I do have an uh, in-store digital team, and so they're really starting to look at those experiences. And we're trying to have all of us think about digital and physical together. I don't know if anyone has ever done body storming. It's basically, um, it's improv uh, in a way. It's, it's um, brainstorming physically. So you could be acting out experiences and acting out services. And when I run this as like a full or half day workshop, uh, we do a body storming activity. So you can learn more about this if you Google it. But it's really, really fun. Uh, this is uh, part of my team I had at REI and we went outside and we basically acted out a bunch of experiences that we thought might improve the customer experience. And if nothing else, it got us talking and playing together and having fun, which brought up a lot of ideas. And then you can start experience mapping and really thinking about what is that holistic customer journey. Chris Risden uh, at Adaptive Path um, has done a lot of really, really great work around this. So if you look him up, um, you'll see, uh, I think actually this particular one uh, is from him. And so these, these experience maps, can be super complex and look really, really daunting, but they can be more simple. And it's just really around starting to do the schematic, the flow of that experience. And to me, this is where wireframes are going, is what is that flow, what is that whole experience? Experience maps can be a deliverable that you give to a client to talk about what's working in their experiences or what's not working or internally. But they also can be really useful just for yourself. Just to think about if you're designing something, even if you're just designing something for the website, you know, because we're all using um, you know, so many different devices and channels these days, if we do our own experience maps and think about you know, what that full experience is and where web fits in and mapping all of that out, all of our work will be better, even if, even if you're only just designing for the screen. So finally, omnichannel, digital and physical, intertwined, anytime, anywhere, about services and experiential. Because we want to design for the future. Design for omnichannel, design for seamless experiences, and for life. That's what's so fun and exciting about this. And one last thing. The future's now. It's not coming, it's now. We're all tied to our devices. The future is you. All of you in this room can have an impact on this. Entire industries are in their customer experience infancy. Think about that and think about where you can help. Omnichannel or holistic experiences or whatever you want to call it, it's huge. And in the time I've been thinking about this and talking about this, it's just increasing and I think it's going to be a while before it's solved, so tons of opportunity. Executives care about this. <laughs> Get yourself a raise. Doing omnichannel work actually really helps you get a seat at the strategy table and be part of those conversations about the entire business. I know because I've been there, I've seen it, I've done it. Because you're not just talking about a widget on a website anymore, as important as that can be. You are truly talking about the whole experience a consumer, a user, a customer has with your company, with your brand, with your organization. So I want all of you to get out there and be a hero. Thank you. So we've got about five minutes for questions. Yes. Good. 
You're already there. You can teach us. Uh-huh. It can, <laughs> which is why some agencies are jumping on it, because they can charge a lot. It doesn't have to, though. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and, and I think it can be true of even just, you know, plain old user experience. Uh, how do you explain the return? Um, I had a lot of success um, both at um, REI and um, at a couple of my consulting gigs um, you know, taking whatever customer satisfaction information they happen to have. Um, there's some really good research out there by Forrester and other people around, um, you know, literally what benefit to the bottom line a better customer experience has. And then even taking, when I had it available, you know, revenue numbers. Um, I've done a lot of e-commerce work, so looking at conversion increases, but, you know, regardless of the industry you're in, you know, there's something you're trying or you're wanting your customer to do. And so you can start to tie numbers to how a better experience, you know, if, if just three more people can complete this task that might be across different channels, um, you know, what percentage of increase that might have on a company. So, you know, a lot of times, I am not a numbers person. A lot of us often who are in this field aren't. Um, if you are, use it. <laughs> Uh, if you aren't, find someone who can at least sort of get you the basics. The other thing that's worked really well for me is when I was able to get time with high up execs, like, you know, up to the CEO, showing them a bad experience. You know, literally walking them through it, um, sh video sometimes. And because a lot of times when you're so busy every day doing your job, you don't really realize how bad it is. That's awesome. <laughs> love that, love that. Thanks, that's a really good question. Yeah, it can be super expensive, but it doesn't have to be. And you can start it really gorilla. Yeah, you in the back. Can you talk about any of your aspirations that might like to be shot or um, what would you think would be Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I, um, when I was ready to move back into the client side, um, I knew I wanted a company um, that was a well-known and well-loved brand, just because it helps me get excited, but a company that had a long history with physical, with brick and mortar. Like I said, I've been doing a lot of e-commerce or commerce work for a while, so it was kind of natural that I would stay, at least for now, in that space. And um, you know, thinking about, especially for a company like Ralph Lauren, and similar to REI, where the customers are aging, the customer base is getting older, at REI, we used to talk about they're all going to die at some point, and they're not hiking anymore. So how do you get new consumers who are using more and more of these devices? And so that was really what kind of compelled me um, was, you know, and my team it really thinks about, makes the business case, comes up with all of the new um, features and functionality digitally, whether that's on the website, whether that's mobile, and whether that's in the store. And I think no one is doing it really, really well yet. And so, you know, it'd be great if two years from now I could come back and go, well, yeah, I did it. But I, I don't think that'll be the case because it's really hard, but it's a really fun, hard challenge. Anybody else? Yes. So that if you're going to, um, the messaging should be consistent yes. with your platform. And for me, as a content strategist, that goes to the heart of my practice. Yes. And what I like to do, which is to um, help clients create one and publish everywhere. Absolutely. Now, I think that's a great point. And I actually have a version of this talk that I give specific to content because content um, in all of its forms is, to, in my mind, the heart of the experience. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, developing those standards and communicating those standards, while that doesn't, to some of us, sound like super sexy work, it's, it's really important. One more? Yeah.
great question. I have not. That is a fabulous question. I mean, a couple of the companies I worked with when I was at Razorfish were in that situation or were going to be in that situation. And interestingly, a lot of what I ended up doing at Razorfish was organizational design uh, because um, you know, my work and my interest in thinking about customer experience, what I've found is, is so much of it has to do with how the organization is set up. And I think that would be very similar for acquisitions. Like, is the acquisition going to run as a totally separate company? What connections can be built? And you know, if I was living another life, I think organizational design is what I would be doing because I think it's, it's fascinating and, and you can't solve these problems even within one company, let alone multiple companies without thinking about how the organization works. Great, thank you so much.